Good afternoon, Greater Boston Association of Realtors. I'm really happy to be here again today. Well, I'm excited, I should say. Um, obviously not happy that we're all pinned up at home, but I'm excited to be bringing some more great information um, today regarding um, lending practices as well as some policy updates uh, from NAR. Um, Want to just take a minute to remind everyone about how we'll be answering questions throughout the webinar. Uh, please push, post your questions through the questions tab. Um, I will be reading them off uh, to the panelists um, who are really excited to have today. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Um, quick introduction, we've got Kevin Fears, uh, Senior Policy Rep for Federal Policy and Industry Relations with the National, uh, National Association of Realtors. Thank you for joining us, Kevin. Um, Sue Quilty, Chair of the Massachusetts Mortgage Bankers Association and Senior Vice President at Residential Mortgage Services, or as many of us know them as RMS. And Mike Kempel, Chair-Elect of the Massachusetts Mortgage Bankers Association and Senior Vice President at Bridgewater Savings Bank. Um, from Mass Housing Partners Program, a Mass Housing Program, we have Lisa Fiendaka, Director of Home Ownership Production and a longtime junior affiliate member. And of course, we'll be joined at the end um, by our esteemed association director, uh, John Volchewski, GIVO Executive Vice President. Um, so getting right into it, uh, we're gonna start with Ken Fears um, regarding the impact of the pandemic on residential mortgage lending. Um, Ken is an in-house expert on GSEs and lending. Uh, he's an important policy making, and um, he's important with policy making guidance from FHA, VA, and the GSEs. And uh, we'll be talking about access and availability to financing, including changes in loan qualifications and restrictions or other adjustments taking place at major national lenders. And finally, talk a little bit about the mortgage forbearance allowance. Ken, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Um, so starting from the top, about five weeks ago, most everyone probably on this on this uh, webinar noticed a surge in mortgage rates. Uh, rates jumped about a full percentage point over a week. It was a real shock to the market. The Fed acted quite quickly, uh, started uh, turned on a, uh, a process or a tool it hadn't used since the last crisis. So I'm referring to what I'm referring to is quantitative easing by which they buy up mortgage-backed securities. And so this pushed down rates. This was a great initial volley by the regulators. And this, this clearly told us that we, we have the pump prime to deal with a lot of the issues. Uh, ironically, the, the last crisis provided us with uh, a group of regulators who, who are ready and have the tools to act. So we saw mortgage rates come down, that was great, but then a number of other issues arose. And we very quickly saw rates not falling as much as regulators and, and market analysts had expected. They only fell about a half a percentage point. Uh, and then we began to see overlays come to the market. By overlays, I mean lenders and originators increasing the down payment requirements, the months reserves, putting caps on debt to income ratios uh, and uh, uh, minimums on credit requirements. So a lot of these started coming into the market really in the FHA uh, and VA space, but we slowly began to see them creep into the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac into the conventional, kind of the middle market uh, and into the jumbo market as well. So a lot of problems kept started creeping in, but they had different sources. So first of all, uh, because of forbearance uh, and under forbearance, even though the borrower doesn't have to pay, uh, the servicer who collects payments from the borrower and then distributes those payments, the principal interest taxes insurance, they have to keep making payments, okay? And that means they're on the hook for these payments for a number of months. Uh, and the, and uh, this kind of forbearance on this scale has never been seen before. It's just unprecedented. So uh, what it came down to these servicers were looking at having to put forward or, or front uh, tens uh, of billions of dollars before Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the FHA and VA would kick in their own payments. Uh, and this is more than they had anticipated. It's more than their business model was structured uh, to really support these tens of billions of dollars in a short period of time. Uh, so the way they defend themselves and defend the capital that they have is these overlays. Uh, and what that means is restricted access for home buyers. And it's a real problem. Now, that wasn't the only issue. Uh, another issue arose where lenders are, are who were, had just funded a loan, but hadn't sold that loan to an investor, whether it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or a private investor uh, who's gonna make their own mortgage-backed securities, the loans would go into forbearance before they were sold. 
Uh, and what this means is the lender, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, won't buy or wouldn't buy loans that were in forbearance. And so this was a problem as well. So lenders were starting to increase uh, their overlays, their requirements. Again, naturally trying to protect themselves and in, in their capital uh, so that they can continue to extend loans. Uh, so we had both of these uh, issues happening at the same time. Uh, just this past week, uh, the FHFA announced that it was going to allow Fannie and Freddie to relax these requirements uh, so that they can actually purchase loans that are in forbearance. Uh, but at the same time, they presented a, a solution. They created a problem in that they, to do it, Fannie Mae and Freddie would charge very significant fees, uh, 5% of the loan balance. So if it's $100,000, $5,000, the lenders would get charged for a first time buyer, 7% for a repeat buyer. Now there are a number of ways that lenders can handle this, try to reduce the cost for home buyers, but at the end of the day, it still means higher costs for home buyers. Uh, furthermore, it doesn't guarantee that lenders won't keep those uh, high uh, standards in place, the overlays that we were talking about. Uh, so it, it just suggests that the, the lender, they're pointed in the right direction, but they really aren't, aren't grappling with the problem yet. Uh, on the servicer front, uh, an, uh, a broad coalition of groups, including NAR, the mortgage bankers, the American Bankers Association, and a lot of consumer groups have all been arguing that, hey, we need to really take this head on and provide a facility for, to, to essentially provide servicers with short-term loans so that they can extend these tens of billions of dollars that they need to extend every month. Uh, feel comfortable and stop imposing these overlays. Uh, right now, the main regulator has said they're going to wait and see. Uh, we've uh, Vince Malta, our president, met with him one-on-one -on -one, uh, just this past Friday. They had a nice conversation, uh, and he expressed our concern uh, and our frustration with this because this isn't just a, a balance sheet problem for servicers now. This is affecting Main Street when you've got these kind of significant overlays uh, in the market. Uh, and, and eventually that will hit the economy. It's just a matter of months. Uh, this is kind of the, uh, the, the leading edge uh, and we'll feel it first. And, and the, and the uh, housing makes up, or real estate makes up anywhere from 15% or 20% of the economy. So eventually there will be a very big knock on effect to the economy that we'll begin to see later this summer. Now, some of the other issues uh, that we've uh, uh, been wrestling with uh, just this past week, uh, Commissioner Brian Montgomery of the FHA announced that the FHA may uh, increase fees in the near future to deal with the surge in forbearance, but also the potential surge in uh, credit losses after the, the wave of forbearance. Uh, this creates a problem, obviously. Uh, we've already got overlays in place. We've got higher credit requirements uh, being pushed on home buyers, you begin to reduce the affordability and you're just going to throw, a, you know, further throw a wet blanket on the market. Uh, and so it's a challenge for uh, the consumers and NAR is addressing it. We sent a letter just yesterday uh, arguing against it. Uh, we haven't gotten a response yet. We'll obviously share that with our members when we do. The VA, interestingly, just yesterday announced a policy that really takes a different tack. The VA actually um, is arguing that uh, once the contract is signed, even before, not contract on the house, uh, but the contract, the, 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 uh, uh, the note on the mortgage, once it's signed, even before funding, they consider that loan guaranteed by the VA. So this gets around that forbearance issue that we were talking about with Fannie and Freddie. And so Fannie and Freddie took that same tack. It would ameliorate that, that issue. So, uh, those are the big issues right now in the, in the, in the, um, in the lending sphere and a lot of what's driving the overlays. The last thing I just wanted to touch on on forbearance, there's a lot, been a lot of uh, inf misinformation floating around out there. And I know we're gonna touch on it in a little bit later, uh, but just in the last week and in the, actually in the last few days, uh, the head of both Fannie and Freddie Mac came out with statements making clarifying uh, that the borrowers eligible for up to 12 months of forbearance uh, furthermore, that at the end of that period, it's not that they're required to make a lump sum payment. There's actually a waterfall of different modifications and repayment types that they can make. Uh, so it's not the case that it's three months only in a lump sum. Uh, and furthermore, the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac actually sent scripts to the servicers, literally scripts like you would read in, uh, off uh, a movie script on what they are supposed to say and how they're supposed to handle situations with borrowers. 
So there's been a lot of effort to streamline and improve the communication with consumers. Uh, and then finally, I'd add that the CFPB and the FHFA, the regulator of Fannie and Freddie, have agreed to share information. Uh, and uh, in doing so, what they are uh, getting at is that the CFPB will share complaints about servicers and lenders with the FHFA. And so the FHFA then can tell Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac who to do business with and who not to do business with. So if their servicers playing games, the message is pretty clear. You, you need to you know, uh, clean up your act or you may not have future business. So uh, uh, with that, I think I probably used up my 10 minutes. So I'll hand the baton back. All right, thank you very much. Um, that was great information. I don't see questions being coming in. Just a reminder, I'm not sure if that's on our end or on um, if there's no questions being asked yet, but please make sure you're putting questions in the question box, uh, not the chat box, um, so that at least can forward those to me. Um, you, know, you mentioned uh, regarding the scripts, um, Ken, uh, regarding forbearance. Is any advice if um, for agents or that they can share with their their consumers or themselves uh, regarding forbearance um, if they find themselves with a mortgage who may not be um, following those scripts, if you will. Okay, um, good good question. Um, CFPB uh, has an open line. Uh, well, well, first of all, before you even go there, these scripts are publicly available. Um, they are published on the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac website. Uh, NER, we have an FAQ uh, document that are, are frequently asked questions, and we actually link to those scripts, and we link to the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidance. So you, first thing I would do is just take that guidance, make sure that the servicer is aware of it. They definitely should be aware of it, but in case they're not, I know, you know, an informed consumer can bring a, bring a, a lot of weight. Uh, if, if that doesn't work, then you can start going up the, up the chain. Uh, and uh, making complaints to uh, to the CFPB uh, or directly to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But before you begin any any of that, you need to make sure that your loan is actually federally backed. Uh, and on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's websites, they have links where you can search to make sure and verify that they hold, they are backing your loan. So that that's if you're having issues, that's where I would start. And I think that's great advice, um, something I've heard a lot is, is direct some of these people to the NAR website until so much information is there that they can use and refer to. Um, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, and, in, and if we get any more questions, um, hopefully you'll be able to, to stay on with us. Um, Absolutely. And we might answer that. Uh, but uh, mm. thank you again for your time today. Um, all right, hopefully you guys can hear me. My internet connection isn't that bad. Um, so coming up next, uh, we're going to move on to a local view of mortgage lending in the era of COVID. Um, again, reintroducing Sue Quilty, chair of the Massachusetts Mortgage Bankers Association and RMS Lending, um, a senior vice president of RMS Lending, and Mike Kempel, chair elect of the Massachusetts Mortgage Bankers Association and senior vice president of the Bridgewater Savings Bank. They will be talking about changes in mortgage access and availability in the Massachusetts marketplace, uh, processing time for loans uh, during this pandemic, and how loans are being handled and implications of the new rural online notarization act. Uh, pass on Beacon Hill. Thank you very much for joining us today. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Jason, uh, thank you. Thanks for. Uh, the opportunity for us to speak with the Greater uh, Boston Real Estate Board and, and GBAR community, uh, hoping that everyone out there is, is healthy, and we're thankful that we are uh, doing essential services in the Commonwealth right now. So uh, great to be with you. Uh, I guess I'll start with uh, 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 Ken. Ken took us down the path of, of some of the negative things that are happening right now uh, that we that we're hoping will not have long-term effects on the market, but some of the some of the actual good things that have, that have happened. As I'm not going to say that uh, that it's business as usual right now, but um, uh, it is certainly not business as usual. But uh, the lending community, lenders that are that are members of the Mass Mortgage Bankers Association here in the state, uh, are uh, accepting applications, processing underwriting loans. 
Uh, moving to closing, we're meeting contingency and closing dates. Uh, the, the important shift in the last five, six weeks has been the move to primarily remote work. Our employees are working primarily from, from home. And while uh, uh, that transition was a bit jarring all of a sudden five or six weeks ago, uh, uh, our, our, our folks have responded very well. Lenders in the community have responded very well. So I think one of the things that, that has, has been a challenge, but uh, lenders and, and our, our staff have responded to is uh, the ability to step up and, and do work remotely in, uh, in many cases, a higher level of productivity than what we had in, uh, in the offices before. Uh, but things are being done securely, remotely, safely, productively. Um, you know, we, we have spent the last few years making the mortgage process a fully electronic from start to finish process. So applications can be taken by phone or online. Uh, documents can be exchanged securely. Um, uh, disclosures can be received electronically and e-signed. Uh, and right before, Ken talked about the, uh, the drop in rates right before the surge, we, we saw the lowest mortgage rates on record in the Freddie Mac survey. And we were uh, uh, right at the time that we moved to stay at home to this transition to remote work. Uh, lenders were experiencing record volumes with new refinance business. Um, and, you know, again, th things have worked well because we were prepared. And most of us doing the electronic process, uh, uh, you know, to a, to a certain degree, but this has really forced all of us to, to, to do it completely and 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 it's worked out um, and things that we worried about five or six weeks ago here locally like uh, the inability to do uh, smoke detector inspections uh, whether or not we were going to be able to record mortgages with registries shut down uh, those things seem like such distant uh, problems today uh, compared with where we were just a few weeks ago and and uh, all along the process now, application processing, underwriting, the appraisal piece, uh, the relief with appraisal flexibility from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac has been uh, not so much a benefit with refinances where we still wrestle with uh, the need to do interior inspections on most transactions, but on purchase money loans, the ability to do desktop and exterior only appraisals with no interior inspection required has been uh, extraordinarily beneficial and allowed uh, our appraisal community, which is very uh, reluctant right now to engage with the public, to do what they need to do uh, and get uh, purchase money loans closed. So we, we've seen, you know, on the appraisal flexibility side and with the transition to remote work happening successfully uh, throughout the industry, uh, some some good things happen here, even though we're still in a pandemic. Mike, I just want to add, uh, you know, along the, the lines of positive things that we've experienced, especially in Massachusetts, uh, n never before has it been as important to us as an industry to have associations that are active and um, proactive, especially in this environment, and the fact that we have such a well-established network between all of the critical players in our industry has really saved, saved this business. I mean, their RMS does business in different states. It's not going as well in other states. You know, Pennsylvania, really, really difficult political environment right now, and they don't have as many advocates for the industry. So I've been just of course, incredibly um, humbled by what all of the different um, partnerships have been able to achieve together. I mean, look at look at the relief we've had in the Commonwealth. It's been really amazing. Um, and so, so that I'm extremely grateful for all of that network that's taken many years to build in the state because it really has helped us out during this time of crisis. Um, and, you know, just Mike with you, that we are very fortunate that 
the lender piece of it, we transitioned into remote working seamlessly and having, you know, the, are helping to kind of get the volume through. It's been innovative, proactive. It's been um, everybody working together to find the best solution to keep realtors, attorneys, lenders, borrowers, sellers safe through all of this. So it's been it's been a real pleasure to, to work with everybody in, in Mass, especially the association. Uh, we can transition to things that aren't working very well, if you'd like. <laughs> Things that we've had to do as lenders. Um, so one of the one of the things I'd, I'd like to just take a minute to talk about forbearance. Um, yeah, I I would say of anything that we have on the plate right now that that keeps me up at night is probably that subject. Um, we have a responsibility uh, to educate consumers and be their advocate to understand the potential negative impacts of seeking forbearance when they don't actually need it. And we, you know, from as an association, that's extremely important to us. As we go back to our, you know, we do our regular jobs, RMS, Bridgewater Savings. It's really what we have, I put at the top of my list from a campaign and education standpoint. And the scripting and consistent messaging is really, really hard to achieve during a time that's so busy when we have so many changes being thrown at us, it's, you need to digest each one of these major changes. Usually you have a week or two to do it. And as an industry, we don't have that right now. Uh, so we, we're taking, uh, we're putting a lot of effort and I would encourage everyone on the call to do the same thing. And I'll give you some examples of situations that I've, that I've heard where it hasn't worked out well for the borrower. Um, we have a, a borrower that applied to purchase a home, you know, $750,000 home, great LTV, perfect loan, and um, they pursued and are in forbearance on their current mortgage, even though they didn't need to do it, because some lenders are taking advantage of consumers right now. It's very unsettling, you know. Uh, had someone given that borrower advice and said, listen, if you're, if you're going to go in the next, you think you're going to want to purchase another home or you're going to make, you're going to need financing in the, in the near future, by being in forbearance, that will hurt you, you know, and, and that, I don't see that messaging very consistently. Um, and so that's, it's really upsetting. The borrower did not know this. And now it's kind of, even though they're not going to be reported as delinquent on their credit report, it will show as a forbearance. And we know how the industry is responding to people that are in forbearance when they're trying to access new credit. Uh, so I think it's extremely important to point that out to borrowers. Um, we've seen, you know, borrowers that uh, will close on a loan and attest that they're, they're, you know, experiencing all this, you know, maybe they're not negatively impacted from COVID. And then the day after they close, they say, I want forbearance now. And, um, once you explain to them that seeking forbearance should be a very serious decision that you undertake because forbearance is not forgiveness and really using those key words to help them understand because a regular a typical consumer won't go pouring through all the FAQs on the CFPB website. They need trusted partners to explain it to them and, and kind of guide them through how it could end up not being a good decision. And you know, the forbearance repayment, I know we're gonna get to that initially, but there's a lot of gray there on what that true what that true agreement is going to be in the long run. And so I think it's really important for all of us to take the time to make sure they understand. Forbearance is awesome if they really need it. Otherwise, it's going to hurt them in the long run. Um, it's kind of what we feel strongly about as an association. Mike, could you do anything to add to that? Uh, no, Sue, other than the fact that the uh, one of the resources for consumers that that uh, that agents can can point to is the uh, CFPB Guide to Coronavirus Mortgage Relief Options. And one of the very first things they point out is if you can pay your mortgage, pay your mortgage. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the common misconceptions both about uh, the ability to request forbearance, as well as the ability to apply for things like PPP loans through the SBA under the CARES Act, 
is that you have to show hardship in order to be granted forbearance or a PPP loan. Uh, and that is that is not true. You do not need to evidence mm -hmm. or, or show hardship uh, in order to request or be granted forbearance on a mortgage. So uh, the best advice we can give consumers is if you can pay your mortgage, pay your mortgage. And we have, yeah. you know, we've seen all of these attestations that investors are requiring, and they're really important from a borrower education standpoint about what forbearance is and um, how it potentially could negatively impact credit, even though we, that's not the intent. And so I think we all have are using something like that, but I would I would really encourage it if you aren't. Sue, one of the impacts of, of uh, adding on to that, one of the impacts of this is the super vigilance that we're that we're all practicing right now to re-verify employment. Uh, yeah. Uh, throughout the pro throughout the process, you know, this 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 used to be a you know ten the, the traditional 10-day verbal verification of employment. You call the employer, or you have a work number verification. Uh, now we're doing multiple touch points during the process of a loan to confirm that the that the borrower home buyer is, is still employed. Uh, uh, we're requiring the absolute most recent pay stub uh, up until the closing date. If the closing is happening on May 1st and, they, and there was a payroll on April 30th, we're looking for that pay stub from April 30th. And um, uh, you mentioned the, the attestation document we're having the borrower attest at closing uh, that they're still employed, that the information that was relied upon in the most recent uh, application document is still valid. Uh, and then, and, and beyond that, there are lenders who are uh, uh, re, re verifying after closing. We've heard stories about warehouse lenders that are uh, mm -hmm. not funding post closing until they can once again re verify. This is all based on uh, the uncertainty in the market. Ken brought this up, but the, the, the lack of that liquidity facility for services, servicers. And uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's uh, agreement to, to buy at a significant discount or not buy certain mortgages where forbearance was requested after closing has lenders scared. It's leading to these credit overlays, but also this, this hyper vigilance on employment re-verification. And Mike, just, uh, uh, that's a good point that you bring up. And, and I think in the spirit of communication with borrowers and buyers, um, make, making sure that they understand how critical it is in that transaction when they sign the PNS or whatever, when they're moving through, protect your credit profile. Don't you know, we we try to tell them this. You know, we're gonna we're gonna check your debt before you close. See if you open anything new. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do that. It is really important right now that they understand um, going out and purchasing a bunch of new furniture for their new home may have a more negative effect than it would have had pre-crisis. And so it's right. a constant. You know, we we're sending stuff out that probably hate us by the time no, we, we send out just remember remember just because we want to protect that that transaction we want to protect that borrower so communication is really key with all of that we, we're seeing loans and credit overlays for factors that we really didn't have to care about before as much yeah, yeah a lot of tightening on the market is you know and, and how loans are being processed from from all different angles it sounds like um we did have a question come in um uh, from immediate past president, Mr. Jim Major. Um, what happens for those escrow um, payments for taxes and insurance during forbearance when the mortgage payments aren't being made? That, that's, nobody really knows. That's not <laughs> set in stone yet, which is one of the really dangerous aspects of it. <clears throat> and when you think about escrow accounts, and how they're confusing for us and where we understand them. You know, the consumers, it's just, it's really hard to understand the impact of not of, of getting forbearance for those payments. Of course, the taxes are going to have to be paid because it's a priority lien. So it's, it's, it's just putting off um, an inevitable, painful increase in payment um, when all of this forbearance protection is lifted. And that, that's what 
you know, makes all of us nervous, I think, is what is this creating down the line for, for disruption after we come out of it? A lot of unknowns, for sure. Um, you know, one something that was shared with me, uh, someone showed me a screenshot of another lender uh, a few days ago. Um, as you had mentioned, the forbearance has mentioned that they know, so maybe not mentioned on the credit report, but it, it, as a factor of their score, but it is a factor when uh, other lenders are looking at that credit profile. Um, we'll see where that plays out, of course, moving uh, forward. Um, but this is a lot of great information. Anything else to kind of close up with for us? Okay. Uh, hopefully, my screen hasn't frozen. Um, so next up, we're going to yeah. Uh, all right. So th thank you very much, both for uh, for your time this, and, and sharing those insights with us. Um, we're going to be moving on to uh, Mass Housing Program and uh, Program for Home Buyers. Um, Lisa Fandaka is joining us from the, she's the director of the Home Ownership Protection for Mass Housing and a longtime GBAR affiliate member. Um, she'll be discussing information information on program guidelines, deadlines, and borrower eligibility qualifications. Um, she'll also be talking about mass housing business operations and servicing during COVID. Um, Lisa, thank you much, very much for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here today. And thank you to Greater Boston Association of Realtors for inviting mass housing. Uh, this certainly is a really interesting times for all of us. And over the last few weeks, you know, mass housing, when we decided that we needed to be working remotely with over 300 employees, started asking some questions of ourselves. You know, how do we continue responsible lending? How are we going to help? And how are we going to help people stay in their homes during this time? Um, yeah, you know, I'm really pleased to say that we're fully operational. So we are locking loans, we are funding loans, we are onboarding um, during this time. So as a housing finance agency, we are unique. Um, we are both the investor, the mortgage servicer, and we are the mortgage insurance company. We work with a network of lenders, so banks, credit unions, and mortgage companies, over 150 who have, who have access to our loan programs. They offer our programs to consumers, they underwrite those loans, they close those loans, they sell them to Mass Housing, and then the borrower pays us, Mass Housing, we're located in Boston. We offer conventional loans, so the loans being sold to Fannie and Freddie that we've been talking about, FHA loans, so these are GMA securities. We also fund loans through the sale of mortgage revenue bonds. So all sorts of investor guidelines are coming into play for mass housing. But all of our loans are income-based. You don't have to be a first-time home buyer to get a mass housing loan, but you have to be income-based, meaning you're going to be making below a maximum income in some parts of the state of up to $147,000. So that's, that's median income in some areas of the state. We continue to offer down payment assistance. So borrowers can still get 100% financing from mass housing with a first mortgage and a second mortgage from the agency. A down payment assistance is offered statewide. We have instituted, just as, uh, as Mike and Sue said, that the temporary flexibilities that Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA are allowing with exterior appraisals, desktop appraisals, and this has all become really common to us over the last couple of weeks. We've all had to make changes very quickly. We've all had to adapt, and we've all had to digest all of this information and come up with policies and procedures that can enable us to lend in this new world that we're in. Um, so those flexibilities, as I mentioned, you know, just some of them are on the appraisal side. As a servicer, and this has been a big topic of just the last half hour on this call, is how are we all reacting as a servicer? So as I mentioned, all our lenders sell the loans to us. So borrower pays mass housing. We service over 20,000 loans for a portfolio of $4 billion. So when we're talking about forbearance, we have a staff in our servicing department answering phone calls, picking up the calls. They're talking to a real person who's sitting at home um, who was sitting in an office five weeks ago, and we're taking over 6,000 calls in the month of March. We've processed over 1,000 forbearance applications. Um, forbearance that we're following the same guidelines everyone else is, except that we're offering it three-month increments. So we're reviewing with the consumer after three months 
what their options are and what's the best plan of action for them. So again, they're calling in, they're speaking to someone live, and they're going through all of those options. You can imagine how this has added stress to both the mortgage industry, to all of our lives, but mostly to these first time buyers who are really experiencing some very difficult times. We're very pleased that our staff is answering these calls and um, helping people navigate this process. While many borrowers are experiencing unemployment, and that is one of the reasons that they can apply for forbearance, right? They, there's, we said the benchmark is you're saying that you're affected by COVID-19, but many people who are unemployed, if they got a mass housing loan, they have an added benefit. This is extremely unique in the mortgage industry but here in Massachusetts, if a borrower has mortgage insurance, because we're the MI company on many of our loans, and they become unemployed, Mass Housing will pay up to six months of principal and interest while that borrower is unemployed. We pay six months of principal and interest. So you can imagine how many people who do not have to utilize the forbearance will be able to take advantage of this benefit and they don't pay us back. We don't add anything onto the loan. And we've had this benefit since 2004. We've paid over $5 million in claims to keep people in homes. So this is working exactly how we had expected it to work. We, we are in a very unique position financially to be able to fund this. And again, we're a self-supporting state agency with the mortgage insurance fund supporting the agency. So having to help, being able to help borrowers stay in their homes we know we're going to be paying record claims. What those will look like, we'll have those numbers at the end of April. Uh, they have to be receiving their unemployment benefit for at least three weeks to file a claim. But as I started this and saying, you know, we wanted to help borrowers. We wanted to know what can we do? What do we do to help people stay in homes? So one of the things is we took a look at what the guidelines were to pay these claims. And one of them was that you had to have your mortgage with us for six months making on-time payments before you could utilize this benefit. Another one was if you had had a mortgage with our mortgage insurance and it was past 10 years, you no longer had this benefit because most people would typically be experiencing unemployment and need some assistance during a shorter period of time when they first got their mortgage, or so we thought when this was we first came up with MI Plus in 2004. So we went back and said, how are we going to help people? So we have waived the requirement that they have to have their mortgage with us for six months. And also for borrowers who have had mortgage insurance, have been paying those premiums, we've extended it beyond the 10 years. And that's something that we're really pleased to be able to do. Um, you know, we remain really committed to keeping people in their homes. Um, we wanna remember to think about the lessons that we're learning now and how we're going to apply them in the future maybe developing the best practices of how we're all operating remotely and how we can still do our jobs. Um, with our mortgage insurance fund, we're realizing that we're going to be able to help people not necessarily take forbearance in day one when they may need it, but to be able to utilize this MI plus benefit. This benefit is on the loans that Mass Housing has purchased. And we also have many portfolio lenders, so banks or credit unions who offered their own first-time buyer products, and they insured those loans with mass housing. So as the MI company, their borrowers who are sitting in their portfolio that they're collecting payments on could also access this unemployment benefit as well. So that's a little bit about what's going on here at Mass Housing. Um, so I really appreciate this opportunity to share this um, with the Greater Boston Association members. Thank you. I mean, what a great program you guys have run over the years. I know um, just so many people have had that opportunity to become home buyers because of the work that you all have done through um, the various programs that you offer, and especially for first generation and first time home buyers. Thank you for what you do uh, at Mass Housing. Um, thank you. We couldn't do it without all of the membership and all of our lending partners. So thank you. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's a, you guys run one heck of a collaborative effort. Um, just pausing a minute to see if there's any other questions that might be coming in uh, for you regarding um, Mass Housing Partnership. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, finishing up, and, and if you do have any questions, thank you to all the panelists that have been on today. Um, 
Sue, Mike, Lisa, and Ken, it, it's really been a great uh, to have you here to update our membership. Um, I think you got so many people thinking that they're not quite sure what to ask because uh, there's, there's so many moving parts here. Um, definitely, we need your help uh, to get through all this stuff. So thank you. Um, and moving on to uh, uh, John Dolchewski, um, our GBAR Executive Vice President. He will be updating us on some financial assistance programs for realtors and GBAR member programming and resources. Um, as talking about the SBA PPP and the EIDL loan programs, um, discussing our new member benefit virtual tour and showings, um, coronavirus, our coronavirus microsite and, and GB, GBAR live webinars. Um, as well as a legal resource update regarding the MAR legal hotline. John, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Jason. That's a lot. Do you want to handle that? <laughs> uh, I'm just no. Uh, <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Um, so uh, first off, I'm excited to announce that uh, at yesterday's uh, board of directors meeting, the uh, association leadership approved a new a uh, member discount program with iSpy360, which is a virtual tour and showings platform. Uh, so we're excited to be rolling this out uh, probably uh, by early May. Uh, we just got to uh, put the ink onto the uh, paperwork, uh, but this will allow members to uh, take advantage of the iSpy360 platform um, for uh, floor plans and virtual tours. Um, you'll have the uh, ability to get that for uh, a re very reduced rate of $20 per month. Uh, and then there is a minimum charge of $15 per uh, tour, essentially, uh, uh, for uploading of the uh, photos and putting that into uh, a video format. But uh, watch for communications from the association as well as information on our website uh, in the coming uh, week or so and uh, you'll be able to learn more, but we'll be communicating directly with you regarding that. Um, just with regard to this particular program, um, you know, certainly uh, the GBAR Live uh, webinars, uh, I think this is our, our third one, and we're gonna continue these uh, throughout the month of May, uh, same uh, bat time, same bat channel, essentially, so uh, Tuesdays at 2.30. Uh, so uh, again, we'll have that uh, schedule out to you, uh, and you can, um, watch for uh, topics and speakers for upcoming sessions over the coming weeks. Um, our coronavirus website page, hopefully you all are familiar with that, um, but that uh, has been up since mid-March, uh, and you can access it through the resources tab on our homepage at gbar.org. Uh, it's also uh, linked right in the carousel on the top of the homepage, uh, and that's got uh, a tremendous amount of information. Um, new to that is our a summary document of uh, what all the local communities are doing in terms of uh, actions and orders and guidance as it relates to um, open houses and showings, residential construction, uh, the status of uh, performing smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector inspections, and also um, evictions and foreclosures, although the new uh, state law uh, for protections for eviction and foreclosure obviously is, is uh, going to um, take precedent over many of those local actions and they'll be following uh, the governor's orders there. The last thing I wanted to touch upon uh, is with regard to just some uh, uh, reminders for folks with regard to the ver various assistance programs that are out there and available for uh, members to take advantage of. I'll start with the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program uh, that opened up uh, last week for uh, independent contractors. Um, do note that you need, do need to go um, to the special site um, for that uh, within the, um, uh, the MassGov website. Um, also, the Department of Unemployment Assistance is holding daily virtual town halls to get more information about this process if you haven't started it. The mass weekly payout is $823, uh, which you have a potential eligibility for, as well as the $600 in uh, uh, unemployment insurance benefits uh, that have been approved by Congress. Um, it is retroactive to January 27th uh, of this year. Um, and um, 
again, you want to go specifically to the PUA side of the website, so the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance side uh, for the Unemployment Assistance Department uh, uh, to apply. Um, also, yesterday, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, a federal program uh, through the Small Business Administration, reopened up after uh, previously running out of funds uh, on April 16th. Uh, so there's a new infusion of cash there. Um, important to know that this covers expenses for businesses for uh, an eight-week period from February 15th to June 30th. There are no application fees. Uh, it can be used for payroll, for mortgage and rent, uh, mortgage interest and utilities. It's forgivable um, up to 100%. Uh, and these are, uh, again, um, small for small business, um, 75, to, in order to be forgivable, 75% of the loan uh, must be toward payroll expense and you must uh, keep the same number of employees. Um, if, if you don't adhere to those specific guidelines, then the, there will be a phase out in terms of uh, what is uh, forgivable. In terms of independent contractors eligible uh, as well and have uh, the ability to have up to uh, an amount equal to eight weeks of the eight week share of their 2019 net profit uh, forgiven. Um, notably, any uh, unforgiven loan amount under the PPP is now counted uh, as taxable income. Um, there also are the economic injury disaster loan and advance grant programs that we want to remind you about. Uh, this also, this program also ran out of funding, but there are advance grants of up to uh, $10,000 that uh, uh, small businesses are eligible for. Um, and uh, notably under uh, provisions that were enacted as of April 10th because of the strong demand for this particular program, uh, that that grant amount is now based on uh, the number of employees, uh, $1,000 per employee uh, capped at $10,000. Um, the loan portion of the program, which has been the more of the existing uh, part of this particular financial assistance, the grant program was introduced as new under the, uh, the CARES Act, but the, the loan portion uh, provides up to an additional $15,000 in uh, uh, loans that are available. Uh, and again, uh, this can be uh, based on your number of employees um, to get you to the additional amount, or, or it can simply be used um, uh, you know, for other eligible purposes for small business. But this would be open to independent contractors, sole proprietors, and businesses with 500 or fewer employees. Uh, so NAR has a tremendous amount of information regarding all of these programs uh, that you can find at nar.realtor uh, forward slash coronavirus. Uh, and I encourage you to go there for the FAQ that they have posted regarding these specific financial assistance programs. Um, I'd also just mention that uh, there's a very well-informed NAR staff person by the name of Aaron Stackley, who uh, appeared on one of our earlier uh, webinars. Uh, and so you can um, also um, reach out to Erin to get questions answered. Uh, and her email address is estackley, so that's E-S-T-A-C-K-L-E-Y at nar.realtor. And with that, Jason, I'm gonna toss it back to you. Awesome. Thank you, John. A lot of work being done by staff. Uh, a couple of questions or really comments that came in. Um, what I say specific to uh, PUA, um, the question is, is 823 the guaranteed amount or is it the maximum amount? I mean, I'm not sure. Are you comfortable speaking to that, John? Um, I am not. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, but I believe, that's the, I believe that's the maximum amount. Sure. So the, the guidance that NAR has been giving us, um, we do a I'll bring back that we do a weekly call on Mondays, the local presidents and the MAR executive team. Um, and the comments that we received was that the $600 portion is from the federal government. That's the federal uh, grant of, uh, amount, essentially. And the 223 that's being offered is actually the minimum amount being offered for PUA. There may be an adjustment later. Um, so everybody is getting 823 because they're basing it off the minimum amount um, until they get the um, 
until they're able to verify the income from the previous year as they, as they work through that. So, so that money will be retroactively available if you actually are due more. Um, that was the guidance as given to us by the MAR Council who's been monitoring um, this particular issue. Um, certainly, there's some confusion on that, and uh, we've heard we've heard it from multiple different ways. But uh, again, the guidance right now is 600 from the federal government, 223 is the minimum amount for PUA, and there might be an adjustment going backdated. Um, and I do see some comments coming in about that. Uh, again, we don't have better answers for you at this time, um, and I think there's a lot of confusion on that particular issue. Um, again, I do want to thank uh, our our panelists for joining us today. Um, we've had a lot of great information from uh, from them. Uh, Want to keep those relationships open and, and the of so, uh, keep those relationships open and make sure that people know that they have um, these resources available to them as affiliate members from the different banking uh, associations, um, from uh, you know from RMS, uh, from uh, Bridgewater Savings, and from. Um, Mass Housing Partnership. Um, so really want to thank them for joining us. Um, and a last thing to point out to everyone, make sure they're, they've seen the posts and are aware of. We are looking to do a thank you video to family members of our GBAR members who are working on the front line uh, of this pandemic as healthcare workers or first responders. We are asking those people, those members to submit photos uh, of those family members uh, with a little bit of information about those family members to communications, that's communications with an S, at gbreb.com. Uh, you can find a post for more information on the GBAR web, uh, website as well as on the GBAR uh, Facebook page, Greater Boston Association of Realtors on Facebook. Uh, you will also, you should have received an email on Friday about this. Um, so please, we, we've had a handful of submissions and we want to encourage as many as possible. We know there's a lot of family members of our members who are on the front line and we want to be able to do something to offer a tribute um, and a thank you to them. So uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, looking forward to speaking with you next week um, and we will be getting more information about next week's program. Uh, any final comments from our panelists uh, if you have anything else you'd like to contribute? Um, we've got five minutes left, or we can all grab a coffee before our next meeting. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll make one comment to everybody. Uh, my advice to realtors would be um, be diligent with the uh, accuracy of any pre-qualifications and pre-approvals you have in the pipeline, and just make sure that you stay on top of those because um, they might need to be updated if it's a, you know, a marginal borrower. Yeah, really important. Keep those prequels up to date. Uh, don't go into mm -hmm. one of a few days old at this point. <laughs> Things change fast in this world. Thank you for that update. All right, guys. Um, anyway, Jason, yeah. The uh, the one piece of news that we didn't get to was the governor's signature on the uh, remote notarization bill yesterday, and. Uh, uh, that's that's really good news. That represents a lot of work that that uh, this organization, both GBAR and and the Mass MBA, have done to get that through as emergency legislation. Um, the two things I want to make sure everybody is aware of about that is uh, it is not the remote online notarization, the the uh, uh, e-sign, DocuSign that some states are practicing. This is a a uh, uh, multiple video recording uh, 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 witness of the borrower's signature for the attorney notary. Um, it's a little complicated and it will require that the individual attorneys, the, the, the notaries have, um, uh, you know, equipment, the ability to record, the ability to retain the recordings for 10 years is the law. Um, and there's still some work to be done on making sure that that uh, each attorney that's ready to do it right now uh, meets the requirements that each lender will have for that for that activity. So it's great news. It it it, it became effective with the with the law yesterday. But before we can put it in practice, there's some work that needs to be done. So.
be careful with racing out to say, uh, hey, closings as of yesterday can be done by video. Yeah, I've heard it explained to me as an extremely encumbering, it's more encumbering than I think anyone thought we'd be landing on um, as far as the ability to do that. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, hey, awesome Jason? Friend. Yeah? It's John. I also have one, uh, I guess, final bit of uh, information to pass along uh, with regard to the payment protection program uh, and the economic injury disaster loans. Uh, important to distinguish that uh, the SBA yesterday opened up the application process just for uh, the um, paycheck protection uh, program. Uh, EIDL uh, has not been opened up, and that's uh, because there's a concern that uh, funds are going to run out uh, very quickly, uh, so they are uh, only accepting for PPP right now. Uh, and the further guidance um, I would uh, pass along uh, from the National Association of Realtors is that um, if you have already applied for an EID loan, uh, pro the SBA is processing the applications in its system on a first-come, first-served basis, as they have them now. Um, and again, uh, with respect to the PPP loans, uh, you should check with your SBA lender um, if you've already submitted uh, and have not yet been approved to see, uh, ensure that your application is still in the queue and that you don't have to reapply. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, one more question that's come in is, do you have to pay back the EIDL? Um, the short answer is for the initial grant, it is a grant. Um, and uh, the if you were to take that further to a loan, then you would then that would be a loan that's repayable. Um, however, keep in mind they changed the terms of the EIDL grant portion to be one thousand dollars per employee. So keep, you know that if you have one employee or your or your or two employees, you will only be getting the one or two thousand dollar grant, um, not the ten thousand dollar grant that was initially disclosed. So, all right. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, hopefully we covered uh, some great information here. I know we, we got a lot of great banking updates, and um, we look forward to speaking with you next week. Be safe, everyone, and uh, you know, take thank care you. of yourself. And Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you.